Welcome to the Ebb and Glow podcast. I'm your host, Janelle Tremblay, and I'm a firm believer that even when life doesn't go as planned, it is taking you exactly where you're meant to be. On this podcast, I'm here to help you finally release control of what you think you want and begin to just trust in the ebbs and flows of life. Each week, I will show you how to build that positive mindset, radiate with self-confidence, and cultivate an unshakable resilience. Let me prove to you that even when life ebbs, you will glow. Hey everyone, and welcome back to the Ebb and Glow podcast. I'm your host, Janelle Tremblett, and I'm so happy to have you here for episode 98. We are getting so close to episode 100, two more episodes, and I'm so excited for that milestone. So today's episode, I'm also extremely excited for because it's an episode with a fellow Newfoundlander. So for anyone who doesn't know, which I'm sure not many people listening doesn't know this already, I'm originally from Newfoundland, the most eastern province in Canada, and it's a big province size-wise, but definitely not population size. And it's always nice to connect with other people from Newfoundland and just chat about kind of where our lives have gone since we moved away from the province. So there's always a lot of connecting points, and uh, I'm happy to share Robert's story today as well. So to give you a little insight into who Robert is, so Robert Greeley's passion for storytelling developed at a young age when he was in the third grade. This led him into a career in the media industry that started when he was 15, and then that allowed him to travel the world documenting professional athletes, political figures, internet personalities, and more. So Robert is really big into content creation. He's big on TikTok. He started his own media company, and he started with very humble roots. He saw an opportunity when he was in university and he saw that the football team at the time had very little social media presence. And what started as a quick ask, just asking to help with the social media, led him into a lot more opportunities in terms of social media and sports media broadcasting. Today's episode's topics are going to be all around storytelling, of course, having the courage to ask for what you want and the confidence to get doors to open for you of doors that probably were never going to open for you if you didn't have the confidence. We talk about social media, building community, creating a niche for yourself, the importance of being relatable when creating content online. We also talk about privilege versus opportunity and versus ambition. Overall, tons of great topics in this episode, and I really hope you gain some value from this episode and the wisdom from Robert's story. So without further ado, let's jump into it, and if you love this episode, make sure to share it with a friend who will also gain value too. Okay, enjoy. Robert, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. It's always a pleasure when I get to do these things, especially with another fellow Newfoundlander, which uh, you know always makes my day. I know. I was just going to tell everyone, everyone listening right now. So Robert's also from Newfoundland and it always warms my heart talking to people from Newfoundland on the podcast because we're just from the same world that majority of people don't understand unless you're from there. No, hundred percent. I think going to school at the University of Ottawa and having a lot of conversations with people who aren't from even the East Coast, that's very apparent. I mean, a lot of people looked at me and said, oh, like the same side of Canada as BC. No, the other one. And then you get a lot of like, oh, okay, so like Nova Scotia. And it's like, no, one more. And, and then we're there. And then I actually had somebody who thought I was a international exchange student. Didn't think that Newfoundland was a part of Canada. That That's only been a one and done situation. I'm glad I haven't had that conversation a couple of times. But yeah, I was very much like, no, uh, Newfoundland and Labrador is very much a part of Canada. That's embarrassing. <laughs> I went to University of Nova Scotia, so I, at least I feel like people who were coming to Nova Scotia for university, even if they were from Ontario, they at least knew a little bit more about the East Coast. But people always thought I was from Boston because of my okay. accent. So, uh, yeah, they thought I was an international student as well, I guess. I it, It's interesting, though, because when you say accent, like I immediately would think with yourself there that like you don't have a strong accent similar to me because I get that a lot. People say, you know, you don't sound like you're from Newfoundland, but, you know. It's one of those things where I think I've actively tried to maybe dilute the accent if needed, but especially in some broadcasting scenarios. However, when I think about it now, too, I know uh, one video did really well online for me, and it was talking about 
like a lot of the comments were basically saying how I, I don't really have an accent. And there was a little bit of like a conspiracy theory going within like, I guess, fellow Newfoundlanders where they're like, oh, no, this guy's not actually from the island. So uh, it still is apparent, but I guess it's, it's really like within what generation and what region of the island you're really in. But yeah, it's definitely, definitely something. A lot of people, that's normally the first thing that gets thrown out at me is like, oh, like you don't, you don't sound like you're from Newfoundland. It's interesting you use the word dilute because I resonate that resonate with that a lot. When I went to university, I remember very vividly, I was asking a girl, I, she had really nice new shoes on. And I looked at her and I said, where did you get your boots to? And everyone was like, wait, what did you just say? Like, are you speaking English? And I didn't know how to re-explain that. But because people from Newfoundland, even though we're educated, like we're going to university, our grammar is very off. Hmm. And so I found myself being a lot more mindful of how I was speaking to, for lack of a better word, to almost dilute it. And that's probably why I don't have it as much anymore. Yeah. And, you know, I have mixed emotions that I've done that because, Mm. you know, at the end of the day, it's always, you know, I am very proud of like where I'm from, but at the same time too, I don't think I've actively worked on it as much. And I mean, I've been home for a couple of years now and I, I feel like this is just the way that I speak, but no, I, I, it's funny because I did have a similar experience with when I was describing a shed party and everybody kind of thought I was saying shit. And it was just <laughs> a, a story that was probably about five, 10 minutes in length that nobody in that group could comprehend the fact and was just laughing at the part that they just you know thought I was saying shit instead of shit and it went on for about 45 minutes oh my god but it's gonna be funny anyone listening to this episode right now they're gonna notice our Newfoundland accents getting stronger by the end of it because when I go I go home next week for vacation and well I will already be home and back by the time this goes live but I my accent will be stronger when I come back oh 100 percent yeah Mm. And I find when I fly home, because we're going on those dinky planes, like the usually the last leg of it, or there's always new Flanders on your flight, obviously, I find I get my accent back within being on the airplane. I will say one thing that I love, and this isn't just a one-off thing, like this is to the point now where it's happened to me three times, where I've been in Toronto Pearson, people sat beside me are waiting for their flight, just like me, and either have some connection to Newfoundland or maybe know somebody from there. And they've always, you know, typically been older people who have just kind of like pride and been like, hey, where's your uh, accent from? Like, oh, you're from like what part, et cetera. And they get into it and we just kind of have a a conversation. And at the end of it, they've always paid for my meal. So like being from Newfoundland in Toronto Pearson has gotten me like three to four free meals, which, you know, I'm all for having that number keep going up because especially as a new grad who doesn't like a, a free meal. That is not working for me in Toronto. <laughs> so I will be hanging out at Toronto Pearson from now on. So if anyone wants to date me or pay for a dinner, find me at Toronto Pearson. <laughs> <laughs> it could be a good strategy. Maybe I just, maybe that's a little secret life hack for people from just actually in general, just start going to the airport, say you're from Newfoundland and just pick a random town and <laughs> ho- hope they're not from the same area. Yeah. Cause then they'll be like, Oh, well, what street did you grow up on? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Okay, let's get into it. The first question I want to ask you that I ask all of my guests is basically what's going on right now? Where in your life have you had an ebb lately or something that's kind of gotten you down? I think right now it's transitioning into understanding sales and that relationship of, you know, communicating with people. I I do think naturally, you know, I love storytelling and it's something that has just gravitated towards me. And, you know, naturally a good story does sell, but when you actually get into those conversations of having like set numbers and expectations and actually kind of being like, okay, here's the sales pitch. Here's what this will do for you. Because I'm also somebody who struggles on the fact of like, I don't want to give people false promises either. Right. And especially in social media, you know, a lot of people always say like, oh, like where's the viral video or like, you know, X amount of numbers. And it's something that's really tough to, to gauge because you're really at the mercy of the algorithm. And when you're depending on, you know, I have strategies to help favor the algorithm all the time that I try and implement. And sometimes it it works beyond expectation. And then other times it, it doesn't, and it's nothing that you as a storyteller is really doing. So to try and translate that into a sales call where it's just like, you know, it's not as simple as just looking at somebody being like, Hey, hundred bucks, a thousand views. Right. Cause you, really can't 
almost guarantee that. And I don't want to guarantee things to people. I come from a marketing and sales background before real estate, before everything. And now as a realtor and also as a podcaster, I have to do a lot of content creation. So I know it from all sides. And I miss the day, not miss, but I I reminisce about the days of Instagram where, yeah, you could, you knew if you were going to get 100 or 200 or 300 likes. And as a marketer back then, I could plan for that. Hell no. Are you planning for anything like that? It's girls gone wild in social media these days. And I think, you know, for the content creators, that's something why you really can't just get tied up in the numbers of it all. And it's something that I've even gotten away from myself in a little bit, which, you know, I've definitely been disappointed just in my own standard of like, you know, communicating things through like, hey, like X number of followers, X number of views. At, at the end of the day, like, you know, a lot of that stuff doesn't really matter. It's, it's more so the actual connection of community that you're facilitating and creating. So when I look at or listen to the difference between like YouTube content and, you know, TikTok or primarily short form stuff, you know, some of the most popular creators in the world with like 50 million followers are really having a hard time drawing audiences out to fill like a thousand person room or anything like that, because it's such short form content and it's a swipe and then you're gone and people might recognize your face, but they might not recognize your name. I'm not saying that you can't facilitate or create a very strong community in short form, but it is just so much harder to accomplish than as opposed to say having like your foundation or your community built on a a longer platform. You know, it's always tough, even with those numbers at the end of the day, they don't really mean a lot because, you know, do I think the 12,000 followers on TikTok are going to, you know, all of a sudden show up to a barbecue event that I'm going to have tomorrow? Like, no, it just doesn't work like that. Right now, don't get me wrong. I've had some incredible conversations with people who have come up to me. Uh, you know, I was at the regatta the other day and somebody said to me, Hey, I'm in town from Toronto. I've been moved away for 20 years. Like I really love like watching your videos come up on my feet all the time. I, you know, I just wanted to say thank you. Like it always gets me homesick, which is one of my favorite compliments because I was in that position as a Newfoundlander living in Ottawa for four or five years. But that really is something that I'm personally trying to get away from in the sense of like, you know what, at the end of the day, none of these numbers really mean anything. It's what impact I can actually have on the person watching the video and whether that's, you know, following me or like going and and creating a stronger connection with me, but more so actually allowing them to take action in their own lives where they're inspired to do something, whether it be go to a certain location or try something new with their friends or you know, starting their own business, what more or less, as long as it in lines with what they want to accomplish in life, then like that as a creator is kind of the biggest achievement that I would hope to make when I put something out there. 100%. And what is interesting to me, your hardest part of what you're doing right now is you are selling services to someone that has no idea how any of it works and doesn't even use it themselves. And that's why they're hiring you. And yeah, that's tough. It's, I, you know, I always try and give people the benefit of the doubt because mm-hmm. I do think, you know, anybody can put together like a good story or even, you know, learn social. You know, one thing, my grandfather, for example, at, at 76 years old after Nan passed and, you know, he was getting a little bit lonely or down in, you know, Grand Bank, which is like four hours from where I'm to, you know, two and a half from where mom and dad are to. And so like he learned like Facebook and Facebook messengers, FaceTime feature And so at 76, after going all that time, you know, not having ever downloaded or used social media, he knows now how to navigate that app and and make the the video call. Right. So I I do always try and allow for the benefit of the of the doubt. And yeah, but at the same time to try and catch yourself where you don't want to overload people with the amount of information, right? Because uh, yeah, I've spent a lot of time learning certain things and I sometimes, you know, spill it all to certain people and like all the different intricacies and, and details and specifics. But at the end of the day, like it doesn't really matter. And simplified language is so important. I mean, as you said, you're trying to learn sales. A lot of the times it's really, for lack of better words, dumbing it down for someone. If, if the average person can't understand what you do or what you're selling, you're never going to sell it. Yeah. And I've, I've gotten, I've gotten comments on videos where they're just like way too complicated words for me, but cool video. Wait, wait, <laughs> which I, get a, 
I get a chuckle at him. Love the honesty. Yeah, it's and it, it is true. You know, sometimes yes, there's a need for say a more complex language, whether it is in a script or if you're trying to obviously convey in like an academic realm of things with like your research or you know a thesis, but in the sense of like, if your goal is just to, you know, connect with a certain audience that might be of a wider demographic, making it as simple as possible would, you know, it's just for the betterment, right? There's so many different factors that play into it, why it's just a a good thing to do. How do you handle that virality conversation? Because everyone that starts a social media platform, all they want is how to get that viral video. How do you explain to people that you're helping out that, yeah, that doesn't happen. And the clients it might happen for, (laughs) it's kind of like winning the lottery. Yeah. I mean, I think it's defining virality for what it looks like for yourself Mm -hmm. and that individual. The thing is too, is, and I mean, I've never hit true virality in in my opinion. And I've also helped and worked on, on some video projects that you know, to this point have about like 10 million views on YouTube. And I still don't really think that's viral, right? Like Mm. you're, the world is so massive, right? I know I've said like, I want to not fixate on numbers and stuff like that, but fortunately mass sometimes is the simplest way to explain. You want to, you want to know the ROI behind something. Yeah. And that, that is a lot of what people want to know and invest. And when you tell Like everybody's all on board. And then when you pitch numbers and you show packages and you show what this is going to cost, the first thing that typically comes out of people's mouth is, okay, well, I need to see the return on investment. Yes. And sometimes you can't really gauge that with organic social. And if a video does hit, say, you know, a hundred thousand views, but you know, only a hundred people subscribed or maybe a hundred people commented or or something like that. Like it was interesting in one of those videos that got like, say, you know, your 10 million views or whatnot. I got a verbal thank you in that video from, from the YouTuber. Right. And everybody thinks that that sometimes that's the be end all is kind of like being shouted out by like a massive creator. And, you know, for the most part, once the video came out, you know, there was a couple of people on Instagram being like, Oh, thanks so much for helping them out kind of thing. Like in the comment section, but nobody stuck around. Like nobody, really continue to follow or anything like that. But when you're looking at something like virality, it's just, you you really need to define it as to what it is for you. Right. I mean, virality for me is having a a spot where I can, I can work with five to 10 people every single month and, and provide them with just what I believe to be a great service and a great product, right. With in video and, and help them grow their business. Yeah. I love what you said to conclude this topic. I love what you said about if you're starting a business, starting a product, a lot of it is who are you? That's what they want to link it to. So me having a podcast, if my face isn't somewhere at all times, they have no connection point. If there's a new guest every week, it's hard to kind of build a connection. But as long as they're hearing me and seeing me every week, the connection gets built. And that's how people subscribe and stay on. No matter what you're doing, people want that human connection. And you know that because you like more in-person marketing as opposed to online. You like them both, but you like seeing the ROI come in person. I think that's what the public likes too. I mean, you Mm -hmm. know, you ask people nowadays, like nobody likes being advertised to. And I think in order to make people feel like they're not being advertised to, it needs to be through that organic storytelling and just something that people can relate to, right? Uh, there are always people who are going to be like, oh, wow, like, you know, that's really interesting, like what you're up to, right? And it could be whether it was something in your academic career and people are just like, I want to know how you were able to apply and get in through that school and go through that degree because I want to, right? Uh, I, again, for yourself, Grand Falls Windsor, right? Uh, so it's like, how did you make that move from Grand Falls Windsor to Toronto, right? And so anybody in, and that on itself is like, okay, like you start in Grand Falls Windsor, that can easily branch out to Newfoundland and Labrador. And then, you know, you take it from the province aspect, but then anybody across the country in a small rural community and, and you know, Grand Falls isn't that small, but it's small. We have and- two Tim Hortons now. We're yeah, a big exactly. place. <laughs> <laughs> but I get what you're saying. Like, yeah, we, we talk a lot about the storytelling in this episode so far, and your story is not, it's unique, but it could be also someone else's story if you just change out the place names or change out the time of your life you did it. The The idea of living in a small town and moving to a big city to create a life, it's been done thousands and thousands and thousands of times. Hollywood movies on that. Topic. Yeah, there's hundreds <laughs> of movies and books written about that. But 
how you tell it and the resilience that you you take to go through it and the growth, that's a full story. Even though it's the same start to finish, it's still, there's a lot of stories to be told in between. I want to talk about your career so far because you've had so many ups and downs and setbacks. And the fact that you're like having your own media company and everything now, most people that went through what you've went through so far would have just sat back and said, you know what? The government can take care of me. (laughs) You know what I mean? Though It's true. Not many people have the ambition that you have. So tell me where you started and tell me where you are now or tell everyone. I know, but tell us. Well, I think the one thing I will say is, you know, I don't want to give myself that much credit. I, Why? You know, I, I think there's, you know, a different, like, yes, I, I do think a part of me is ambitious, but I do think there is still a lot of privilege, right? Like we're just recognizing privilege and just knowing the fact that, you know, I've been very fortunate to have some credible people with in my life. Like I've had a lot of just run-ins like that throughout my career up into this date where, you know, there's a lot of like, yes, ambition. And I have put my name forward and I've tried to do it, but at, at the same time, I still need to recognize the privilege that I have with just the investments that a lot of people have given me. And then just, you know, a little bit of luck, if you will too, but, you know, again, really just recognizing the fact that, there's been a lot of people who have stuck their neck out for me for for better or for worse. And there has been times where I've made mistakes. And if I was somebody else, they it probably would have been their last day doing that opportunity, but I was still able to continue through, you know, to just not recognize the privilege would just be dangerous for, for myself. Right. And I think I would get, you know, a little bit too caught up in what I'm doing. And for, if you fall into a rabbit hole that deep, you could potentially just, get into a sense of just complete arrogance. And I try and avoid that as much as I can, because I I do really want throughout this journey to just really make sure that it's not just me who's been keeping everything on the road. You know, I first wanted to just hosting and doing broadcasts. And I was only supposed to be there with Eastlink volunteering to like pack and unload gear. And he's like, oh, you want to host? Sure. I, I never lifted a box. Right. And they mm-hmm. were looking for a volunteer specifically to help with unloading gear. And he he put me in front of the camera, let me host that senior hockey league show for, I mean, however long I did it now, I can't remember, but, and as Brian went on in, in his career to, to Rogers and they, they had the St. John's ice caps, which was the Montreal Canadians farm team. He forgot something in the meeting room and went back in and they were like, Oh, like our, our co-host for tonight canceled. Like he had a family emergency come up and Brian was like, Oh, I know a guy and, and just called me. Right. And pitched me and stuck his neck out for me when I'm like, I really didn't have any credibility at that time. Right. And that, but I, mean, I completely disagree with everything you're saying. <laughs> I don't think I would never describe any of this with the theme of privilege. I get what you're saying, mm. but I think you can have that in the back of your head and not make that your narrative or your theme of what you need to remember. I don't think that, like not think that is not the word I would use at all. The reason why you got those opportunities is because someone saw a skill in you. That's not privilege. That's seeing someone would be good at this job. Here's a door, someone opening a door for you. There's a little luck, but you, you've you set yourself up to be able to have that luck in front of you by having skills, by having confidence, by having the ambitiousness to go after what you want, to be able to put yourself in a position to be able to be next to that door that could potentially open. So many people will stay at home and sit on their couch and not do anything about anything they want to do in life. It's not privilege, in my opinion. I we disagree, and that's fine. But I, no, I think I, I wouldn't use privilege as one of your main words when you're storytelling at all. I, I appreciate that. I think you know maybe it is a little bit of imposter syndrome, but hundred percent. And I think I think it sounds like someone or a couple of people have called you arrogant in the past. So now you're almost like trying to flip it the other way, and it's you're going too far the other way now. I'd I'd rather be arrogant than. <laughs> You know, at least arrogant, at least, you know, like you're good at something. Yeah. Well, hey, don't get me wrong. Like I, I have a lot of confidence in my craft. I know, I know I'm really good at what I do and I, I take a lot of pride in being a, as good as I possibly can. And I'm always trying to learn and I'm always trying to practice and I'm, you know, it's never, 
it i haven't really had had an off day and you know it's going on probably you know four or five six years it just seems like every day there's there's something that i i've just been trying to do whether it is filming or learning you know better edits or anything like that but what do you mean by off like there's not been a single day where you feel down or not a single day where like off work Oh, off work. I mean, I, oh, yeah, I, I have off that's days. That's normal. Like, yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> I have off days all the time. Um, but there's basically you're always kind of craving knowledge and craving learning and craving like moving the needle a little bit farther. Yeah. And I think it's just one of and those. And then you're questioning where... why doors keep opening for you. Come on. <laughs> this is ridiculous. <laughs> Well, again, too, like some of the times, like some things are, are very simple, right? So it's like, even though like say, yeah, there's nothing on the go on the Saturday, but I'll still post like, you know, a short or a reel or something like that. Like it, it is, a, a, a even though it's like 15 or 30 minutes, whatever I can get it done and depends on, you know, the story and what's going on that day. It is a little bit of work, right? So it's never really completely shutting your mind off to it. And especially, you know, uh, social media for a lot of people now is also a pastime, right? So like mm-hmm. when you're, when a- an option for pastime and entertainment also overlaps with work, it does get a little uh, struggling. Yeah, yeah. And I'll try and convince myself when I'm scrolling being like, yeah, no, this is just research, right? And then <laughs> That's a, what I do. <laughs> a half hour goes by or an hour and you're like, oh, like, you know, and I was probably even a little too generous on those timings. Uh, you know, oh, we always think it's a lot less. <laughs> yeah. You know, for me and, and my career it really did start, you know, at the beginning of just wanting to host and broadcast and, you know, watching SportsCenter and, and being a fan of, you know, Jay Onright and Dan O'Toole. And those are two guys that I later in my career, I got to meet and just kind of see how they work and like what the behind the scenes looks like that when they came to Newfoundland and did a few shows. And, you know, it's just cool. Jay was somebody who told me a lot about Toronto Metropolitan University, formerly Ryerson. And so that became my dream school for so long as I was going through high school. And, you know, as a kid from Newfoundland, I didn't really know much. I wanted to do journalism originally and Mm -hmm. didn't even know about Carleton, which is as a U Auto alumni now, it pains me to say, you know, that's one thing that they can be, they can be good at is they Mm -hmm. do have a very strong journalism program, but just having that interaction with Jay and learning about that school that became kind of like my dream school. And then just, you know, really invested that like, you know, the thought of potentially just going to Ontario to do post-secondary. And long story short with that, I never really had the best grades in high school because I was kind of delegating my time, volunteering a lot and spending time just, you know, working on the photo and the journalism stuff and the extracurriculars. I, I would just always get waitlisted for Toronto and, you know, could never really get off yeah, that Yeah, you need list. really high grades to getting into the Toronto schools. Yeah. And especially with the sport media program too, like a lot of experience. I think, yeah. And I think, you know, my experience definitely helped me and was one of the reasons why I got waitlisted. But mm-hmm. uh, again, like at the end of the day, like, especially for programs like academics and, and the grades do matter more yeah. than what you think, because uh, unfortunately they, they need I, good grades to keep their standings up. Yeah, exactly. An entry requirement is an entry requirement, right? And that is unfortunately mm-hmm. the baseline. And if you can hit that baseline, then, you know, Everything right. else should be should be golden, right? You know, stumbled upon the College of North Atlantic, and you know that year home was definitely good. And doing a comprehensive arts and science certificate, I believe it is, allowed me to be home for a year, and that also mm-hmm. kind of helped me get the ground running on a few things. Like within the career, that was when you know I started kind of working with a few teams through like social media, and you know ultimately it brought me to U Ottawa with a little bit more social media experience to, mm-hmm. you know, approach a football team and be like, hey, like let's do a job here where. Mm -hmm. you know, people kind of notice that this is something that you need to invest in as a, as a university sports team. And, uh, you know, it was one of the best decisions I ever made in my life. GG's football, you know, there's guys in that organization and that program that I owe so much to, and they really did make my university experience Mm. incredible from the players and their, their parents bringing out my birthday is like Thanksgiving weekend on like October 14th. So Ah, so that's homecoming usually. Yeah, well, we'd always have like some form of game and stuff like that. So whether, you know, be offers from like the parents to go to their house, like in Toronto for Thanksgiving mm-hmm. dinner, or even parents bringing me out brownies for my birthday, just thanking me for, you, you know, doing the job that I was doing like that definitely didn't, especially around those times didn't make being so far away from home, really feel it in, in a sense. And, you know, it was just really really humbling experience to kind of go through uh, like four years with those guys and 
really just kind of see them all grow too, right? Like some of my buddies now on that team are, are doing chiropractor school. Some kids that I've helped recruit are now like being drafted second overall in, into the CFL and they're, they're starting their pro careers, right? And it's, it, you know, it's really cool that you can play a small part in that journey. And, you know, when guys post for other guys' birthdays now and stuff like that, like they're still using all your photos and everything like that. And, you know, you do get- You the, feel part of it all. Yeah. And it's a lot of fun. And that's, you know, one of the things that I love about sport, like, don't get me wrong, it's a very harsh environment to work in. And like you are on the road and you are traveling a lot, but that is just something I personally have yet to find an environment where a a group of people can collectively work together and be so passionate and motivated for one singular goal. Everybody really does want the same thing. And, you know, there's some games that still to this day where it's just like, oh, like, I I wish it had gone a little different or it's like, oh, like, you know, what more could I really have done to just help the environment that day or like grab this recruit or something like that? Like, I remember, you know, working on a couple graphics and stuff like that for potential recruits and, you know, then they go off to say Calgary and, you know, Calgary ends up winning the national championship in like three or four years. And, you know, you do wonder sometimes it's like, oh, like, you know, if we were able to get those guys, like, could that have been us? Or like, would, mm-hmm. would, it, would it have been written any different? And at the end of the day, you you know, it's all hypotheticals and you yeah. can chat about it as, as much as you want. But, you know, it, it's just more so you got to leave all that behind and just look at, at, back at it fondly, which I really do. And, you know, I try to get to Ottawa every October now for mm-hmm. the the Panda game and which is our big like homecoming. Uh, it's actually the largest university sporting event in Canada. And, you know, it's us versus Carlton. We've won now, I think, like four years in a row, three years nice. in a row. Panda game. We I have friends lost. that went to U of O. Did you know that yeah. that was the university I wanted to go to? Really? No, I didn't. Yeah, my mom said no. She said, (sighs) your grandparents are in Halifax. You can go to Dalhousie. That's as far as you are going. But I wanted to go to U of O. Uh, Dal's got some good street parties I've heard, though, too, you know, so maybe... Or maybe a similar well i guess it maybe maybe it all worked out for me maybe mom saw me through high school and she's like mm, i see you like to party and i heard Dell has good parties <laughs> but i mean if she said that as a reason i probably would like yeah yeah let's go to Dell. <laughs> yeah fair yeah it's it, like it definitely worked out i think now going on and doing my master's at, at toronto and finally getting into my my dream school after you know is it as much of a dream in? as it, as you thought anymore <laughs> Well, it it was interesting because I finally got in and then, of course, everything was online with the pandemic. So like my first day on campus was for like my graduation, right? Like throughout my master's program. But This is not how I pictured this dream. It's not as good as I thought. But I've gone on to meet a lot of great people who are graduates of that same program that I try to get into now because, you know, the sports world is, is very small and you know, it really puts it into perspective because I always, you know, I was talking to one buddy and it was who went through the that program and and that Toronto downtown Toronto student experience and I was saying I was like yeah I really wish I had a, gotten that experience right and he like I feel like I missed out on being a student in Toronto because you know my master's was online he's like man that's so funny because all of us like we all say like we feel like we missed out on like the classic like student university experience like say in a in a Queens or a, or an Ottawa or, or a Dow because we're yeah, we're Toronto doesn't get, Toronto. get that no, no you you, well, you're not getting you're not getting a, a college street party or a university no. street party downtown Toronto. Like that's just and, not it's happen. a very different experience. I mean, I help yeah. students get rental apartments here in Toronto and like I put them in the same condos I'm putting young professionals. You know, it's a very, very different experience than mm-hmm. like the experience that you and I had living yeah. in res and all that. And so I think that's a bit like it's an important thing for perspective too, right? Because I also think me as a storyteller and stuff like that, it's like, you know, I'm always like, oh, like you know, imagine if I lived in LA and like was able to have that environment or like, oh, like if only I had a chance to work with like an NCAA program on like such a big scale. And I've recently tried to just get out of that habit because at the end of the day, you know, there's just an opportunity to where I currently am. And I can, I don't need to be in LA to be the best storyteller that I can be. Mm -hmm. I don't need to be with an NCAA football market to have the impact that I want to have. If I'm there and I, and I have the opportunity in, in some capacity, whether it's Newfoundland, Ottawa, I, I want to be able to achieve, right? Because at the end of the day, if I can't do what I want to do here, then, you know, there's no reason why I couldn't go to LA and, and do the same thing. Right. And, but again, 
it's getting out of that mindset because it is one of those things where it's like a lot of people are just always like, oh, like I'll, I'll do it when I get a nicer camera. I'll do it when I get a better microphone. I, I've tried to, you know, really get away from that and just optimize the, the current tools that I have. So if I can't optimize what I have right now, how am I going to be able to do that when I get that big thing that I've just always wanted? It's a great life lesson. Learning to love what you already have and learning to make the best of what you already have and stop wasting so much energy in wanting the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. It's like, what about what's right in front of you? You know what I mean? It's exhausting because it doesn't go away because no, it's never as, soon go as, you, away. as soon as you hit a thousand followers, you want 10,000. As yeah. soon as you hit 10,000, you want a hundred and then a million and then 10 million. And then it, it doesn't stop. Mm-hmm. It's not going to. Right. So yeah, it's, and that's something that I've struggled with and just try to shift that mindset. Right. And really just realize and recognize where I'm to now and, you know, optimize what I currently have. I want to ask you, where do you get the courage to, like you said, when you worked in these types of jobs where you're pitching yourself to sports teams to be able to do their social media and photography and whatnot. I think that's very interesting to people because that seems like a door that's really hard to get open. So one, how are you finding who to talk to, to be able to get you these opportunities? And two, where do you get the courage and to, to just get your foot in the door? Well, I think, you know, again, like the finding the people, like it is very much, you know, sometimes luck, sometimes just doing a bit of research, uh, you know, LinkedIn is a, is a solid tool. How I got involved with football though, is like, yeah, give me like specific examples. How'd you get involved in this one? Man, Ty Beezer, he's probably not listening to this, but love you like a brother. Well, you're going to send him a link and he'll listen. Yeah, I I will. And uh, he just lived on my floor in residence. And that is somebody who, you know, was instrumental to my university experience. And, you know, living with him, I was just like, oh, how was the games this weekend? Like what happened? And I was just like, oh, like, like who's running your social right now? Because we can definitely like do a little bit more with this, right? Like there's potential here to, to kind of grow, right? And have somebody designated to it. And, you know, just from talking to him, you know, I had a meeting with Joey and Joey, he still is actually the high performance coach at U Ottawa. And, you know, when I just sat down and met with Joey, it was just very much just like, Hey, like, you know, here's what I want to do. You know, that was four or five years ago, which was, it was a little bit easier then. I think now, if you're wanting to make connections, I I do unfortunately think that, you know, you have to kind of come with something right out of the gates, especially if you're a video maker or content, Mm, like there's a lot of video makers, you mean? So there's a bit more competition. Yeah. And just anything in creative too, though. And like, it's a lot easier to, know if I'm going to like what the product is, if uh, you have something ready for me. Right. So for example, if I was going to say, uh, so like I get what you're saying. So back then four five, six years ago, you could go in with an idea because no one was on social. No one was creating video content. So now it's like, they're probably already doing it. And now if you think you can do better, you got to come in with a portfolio. Yeah. And it's a yeah. fine line of trying not to be a little disrespectful too. But, you know, if I like say, if I wanted to be your podcast clips editor, like I yeah. would download, You're, you'd basically of, be coming to me and saying what I'm creating myself is crap. Yeah. And but it's, that's uh, how it could come across exactly what you're saying. It, it, if you're it not a fine line. Yeah. If you're not careful. So I think, uh, you know, like I would, I would almost download like some of the video episodes that you have and and then cut them up into like my editing style to what I feel like could be like, you know, really good to like connect with your community and say like, maybe do a little bit better with, you know, audience retention or some of those strategies. And, you know, so essentially you have those three examples and it's just like, Hey, here, like, take a look. I, you know, come from it in a genuine spot, you know, Hey, I, I love doing these things. I love putting this together. Like feel free to use them if you have a need for them. If not, no worries. But I just like, I love doing this stuff. So mm-hmm. like here, what do you, what do you think of that? Right. And, uh, again, too, like, I think putting yourself out there in like continuous standpoint of, of just the, the constant, like personal branding content, like it, it is so mm-hmm. big. Right. And if people can get a sense of who you are from that and just what, they're doing like it, it does make that a little bit easier and they will you know reach out to you like my tiktok and and social media have generated a, a lot of business leads where people are like hey like i'm interested because then they already know kind of what your content looks like they already know what 
the vision looks like. And it's a little bit easier for people to make that jump into the investment. Worst thing is really just somebody saying no, right? I've always, uh, I've kind of been thinking about this a lot lately because it's like, you know, when you get like the negative comments and stuff like that, like sometimes it's just kind of like, yeah, like at the end of the day, like people are going to think this about you anyway. Like nobody goes through life liked by everyone, right? And just taking a step back and, and really realizing that and just accepting the fact that, okay, you know what, at the end of the day, nobody is going to like me. So baseline, the most important thing is that you like yourself. And, you know, a big step in doing that is making sure that you're just doing things that you love to do. And for me, that is storytelling. And, you know, what goes with that is putting myself out online. And like, when you get those negative comments or anything like that, you know, at the end of the day, it's like, you know, that's their opinion. Like, there's going to be people in your office who don't like you. There's going to be people on the street who are literally just like, you know, what are they wearing? Like that hat is stupid, but just keep to the baseline and keep true to, you know, make sure you like yourself. And, you know, a big way to do that is investing in things that you love to do. You know, I'm a big Yes Theory fan. So they're a classic brand of like seek discomfort, you know, getting out of that comfort zone and just, again, pushing yourself to be the best version of yourself and really getting to that state of acceptance of like, this is who you are. Last topic that I want to talk about. One thing I found interesting when we talked last is you're starting to create a bit of a niche for yourself within Newfoundland. And I think there's a lot of white space in Newfoundland in terms of there's a lot of cool cafes and breweries and restaurants that don't do a lot of video or digital content at all. And I don't think there's a lot of people in Newfoundland offering those types of services to these small businesses, but you said you have been, right? I think that's a huge opportunity for you. Yeah. I mean, you know, there are a lot of people who create content and everything like that. Like there's never not going to be competition in, mm-hmm. in a space. I do enjoy like going out to a lot of these like personal, like small local spots. And that's, you know, kind of how it started just from like kind of documenting daily. You were kind of seeing people being like, oh, like, you know, I've never heard of this spot before or anything like that. What's next? Like where, where do you want to grow your brand and your media company? Like what's it all for? Where's it going? really want to do is I do really like I hope that is the next step is just to expand and not necessarily you know your classic like travel vlogger but it's investing into just like you know more adventures and and sharing more stories and you know if that comes from going to Argentina or like other parts like around the world and like trying to accomplish different things then that's really kind of what I see next you know for myself right and you know, it, it's not really out yet anywhere, but I'll be trying to do the LA marathon then in March of like 2023. Cool. Uh, um, so, you better get start training. Yeah. 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 I, that's I'm, not far away. Yeah. I, I got, hold on. I got like a six month plan that, that starts okay. in, in September. September okay. 19th. Fair, fair. So, but yeah, like I think. I, I guess you're going to be running while you're in Argentina too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm I'm looking forward. And that's actually one of my favorite ways to like when I was in Miami or that has been one of my favorite things to do is just go for kind of quick runs like while you're traveling. Like it's a different way to kind of see where you currently are. If yeah, you want to think- finally link that to privilege, there's your privilege because <laughs> I can't go running for a run in a random city. No, no. And it, I'm exactly, just teasing you. <laughs> no, it, it, it is a really strong point that like a lot of people, you know, I think the story of an underdog has been such a high value thing that people want to convince themselves and really push that narrative for themselves. But like, it's okay to recognize the privilege. It's just what you do with the privilege. Yeah. Is There's tons of people that were born life. with a ton of silver spoons in their mouth and they're doing nothing. No, I think again, for, for me in the, in the future and where I'd like to move forward is again, just keeping telling these stories and just really just documenting my life a little bit more to the point where I'm, I'm very proud of. I think I have been in the past, very shy and reserved to my storytelling and, you know, whether that's been like confident, like bringing the camera out and, you know, there's a couple of moments that I've passed where I'm like, oh, I really wish I was more confident and, uh, documented that moment better because you don't really know who's going to be there the next time around that you get that chance. Right. And so, you know, one thing that I think of is like, you know, my grandfather, my father's side, he passed away a couple of years ago and I, I was home for my birthday one year 
you know, I had the camera out and like everybody was singing happy birthday and I didn't really like point the camera up at anybody. So I just have his voice and that's really all I kind of have. But like when I play that back, sometimes it's just kind of nice to hear them, hear him. But I'm like, oh, like it would have been so much nicer to, you know, have like the, the actual video and being able to see him. Right. So just really taking that elevated step to documenting my life and documenting the, you know, the personal brand and, and doing more things that kind of push me out of my comfort zone, like trying to do the marathon and, you know, I don't really know what's next after that. I mean, I had a conversation with a LA videographer yesterday, actually, to document that marathon. And I, wow. I, after our conversation, I was like, okay, like, I, yeah, like we're we're gonna do it. And it's still now, right now, like my stomach is turning. I'm like, oh, like, do I really have this in me? But we're gonna Take try and see. It. Yeah, but no. So that's that's really, you know, what I hope is next. And I hope that I just kind of continue to make things that at least you know, impact one person in a way that, you know, they, they just take action, right? Like they do something, mm-hmm. they, they see it and they're like, Oh, I want to do this or I want to try this. Right. So I think, I think that's important. And, uh, you know, at the, the baseline of it, it, it's what makes me happy. And, you know, a lot of people, like I said, have invested a lot of time and, and resources into getting me to this, this point. And so I just hope I can make them proud and, and make myself proud. Amen to that. I was going to ask you like any final last thoughts or anything, but I feel like you just nailed it. So I did say I was like a big Yes Theory mm-hmm. fan. I actually have their their Spark game here. Um, so it's a, it's a bunch of random cards. So I'll, okay. I'll flip the script and I'll ask I'll ask you a question. They're, they're random oh, cards. So okay. I, I, I don't even no know idea. what Yes Theory is, which is weird because I'm very like up to date with the uh, self-development they're a, world. Uh, they're like a YouTube group. Uh, okay, maybe that's out. how I've heard of them. Yeah, I, I just really like the message and the brand. I mean, I'm not really, I'm not affiliated with them in, in any standpoint, aside from just, you know, enjoying their content. So yeah, I, yeah. I, I did a quick shuffle. Okay, I'm this not, better be I'm a good a, question. So here, here's the question I got for you. What's one thing you wish your parents understood better about you? This is such a good question. That's a big one too, yeah. Wow, that's like a good question for like a full solo episode. Ooh, I think it's probably my desire and dream to do things a lot less traditionally. So in terms of like one, th- a couple of things that I really need to do as soon as possible, or I'm going to lose my mind is I really need to start traveling the world. And my mom is really not liking the idea of me solo traveling. And she's always saying like, well, why don't you just get a friend to go with you? Or why don't like, like ask a guy friend to go with you? Because she's just thinking about safety. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I'm telling you, mom, I need to do this alone. And so just, just for her to understand that I need almost that eat, pray, love moment before I go do any other part of my life. So I think, I think that's, that's what I'm going to leave. I just wish they would understand my desire and need to be able to go see the world predominantly on my own. Oh, I love that. I wish you mm-hmm. all the best in that journey. That's it's yeah. going to be exciting and I can't wait to see it. I know. Watch me turn into a little travel blogger instead <laughs> or real estate at the window, throw the podcast out the window and start all over again. That's, yeah, that's uh, what you want. I, I honestly, I want to put it past me. <laughs> These city lights, they're, they're only good for now. We'll see. Hmm. Anyways, with that being said, Robert, please plug where people can connect with you further and tell us, yeah, like tell us your TikTok, everything so people can follow along. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's pretty simple. Everything's just Robert Greeley with an extra Y like on everything. So Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, you know, Greels Media is kind of where we've landed on the name for the media company. So, you know, greelsmedia.com. My DMs and everything like that are, are pretty open. And, you know, I love being able to have as much conversation there as I, I can, but, you know, email is always better too. And, you know, for the most part, you can find those contacts through the website and everything like that. And obviously in this episode, you've given a lot of great info and inspiration. So what's one thing that the audience can help you out with today? Get outside. That, okay. that, that if every audience member just just go outside for like 20, 30 minutes and really cross that off the to-do list today, whether it was a walk or spending some time with the dog or even just getting out for, you know, a game of Frisbee or anything, whatever it might be. Agreed. It makes the world of a difference. Robert, thank you so much for being here. It's always a pleasure to have another Newfoundlander on. And yeah, it's been a pleasure. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. Thank you. 
Did you know that I'm not only a podcast host, but in my full-time career, I am a Toronto-based real estate agent. In 2021, I closed 100 deals. Yes, you heard that correctly, 100. So if you or someone you know is a busy professional looking to get into the Toronto real estate market and looking to work with a realtor who values your time, make sure to reach out to me and let's get connected. And in the meantime, we'll see you here back next week.